coming up next. 75 or 80 percent of our recruits now are career changers. So they they've already had one career in their life. So they're in their mid to mid to late 30s, sometimes even 40s. We've even had recruits in their 50s. Welcome to the Job Talk podcast, where we talk with people who love their jobs. Our guests open up about their challenges, surprises, and secrets to success in their industries. Through conversation, we explore their careers, past work experiences, and the education that got them to where they are now. Today's guests are Sergeant Angela Tetley and Constable Brennan Martin. Here's our job talk with two police officers. I think if you were to ask any kid what they want to be when they grow up, a popular answer would be to become a police officer. By becoming a police officer, did you guys fulfill a childhood dream? Um, thanks for having us, first of all, by the way. We're really excited to be here. Um, and honestly, no, I wasn't one of those uh, little girls that dreamed about it when I was young. I didn't really consider it until I was in my early 20s. And it's kind of strange because my dad was actually a member of CPS before me. So I grew up my whole life uh, as a policeman's kid. So, um, But I didn't really uh, become inspired to become a police officer until I was in my early 20s, actually. So kind of different, I guess. Brennan, and how about from, you? And for myself, uh, first off, thank you very much for having us both on. We're uh, we're both super passionate about the job and super passionate about sharing our experiences. And uh, we're very, very pumped to be here. So for myself, um, I'm the same as Ange. I actually didn't have that uh, sort of mindset early on in life. My dad spent a bunch of time in the military and he was gone a lot. Um, I knew for sure that I wasn't going to be in the military because I lived it for like 18 years, had my room tossed and everything had to be perfect all the time. Super thankful actually for that now looking back on it because it's contributed to who I am today, but it, it didn't happen to me until I went on a ride along when I was 19. Okay. Why don't we jump right into it? Let's, let's talk about the recruitment process. So the person that's sitting at home and is looking to become a police officer, can we, we talk about what the start is for that person. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like Brennan said, we're, we're very passionate about policing and we're very um, excited and uh, grateful to work for this organization. And so I think the two of us as a team in recruiting are, uh, we're kind of much to deal with sometimes in recruiting because we're so excited all the time. But uh, the process is a long one. It's challenging. Um, and it honestly takes about six to nine months, even just to get through the process of applying to be a police officer. And there's reasons behind that. And that's because we want to have the best people in this organization. We want to take the time to really get to know who our applicants are from all aspects of their life. So in order to apply, uh, everything's done online. You go to our website, join.calgarypolice.ca, uh, and it's a step-by-step -step process. You're going to submit your application and a number of documents that goes with that, you know, like stuff, um, your education history, your work history, a really, really thorough personal disclosure form where you're going to tell us all your deepest, darkest secrets to complete strangers, which is pretty uncomfortable for people a lot of the time. But uh, we need to know who you are. So um, that honesty piece is going to come into play a lot in the application process. We want to know who you are and we want you to tell us everything in that personal disclosure form. We don't need perfect people, but we need honest people. We need people that abide and live by our core values. And in saying that it's okay that you've made mistakes when you were when you were younger or in previous life or history, that's totally fine. We want to know that you've made mistakes worked through them, learned from them, and moved on to become a better person. So once you've completed your application online, uh, you're going to go through some of our testing. The first process is going to be your written test or your uh, APCAT. We, uh, and throughout the, all of these processes, we have resources to help people make it and be successful. So the written testing is first, and we hold um, APCAT workshops for people to help you study and help you prepare for this exam. It's actually only about a 50% pass rate. So it's not something that people can just sign up and take it and expect to be successful. It's something you definitely have to prepare for. And I know Brennan and I speak the same language when we say, we want you to not, don't bother pushing the button until you are 100% prepared. And that's why we offer all of these resources to help people prepare right from the beginning. 
So after the written test, uh, you're going to do your your physical readiness test, and often called the fitness test. This is something Brennan and I are very passionate about. We, uh, again, offer those programs, a program called Run with a Recruiter, which is one of our programs where we bring people in from the public. They come out and train with us today. Both of our legs are like jello right now because we had a super hard leg workout today after a big, long run. And I got so, chicken legs, so it's not fair. He really does. It's crazy. <laughs> but uh, so Run with a Recruiter is a great reason resource for some of our pre-applicants to just come chat with police officers, ask those questions, ask those real questions, and we'll give people real answers while at the same time preparing physically. Um, again, we want people to be 100% prepared. And so so the physical test, the A-PREP, is a, a leger or the BEEP test, the 20-meter shuttle run, as well as the PRC, the Pursuit Restraint Circuit, which simulates a, like a foot chase and a, and a struggle with an offender. So we need people to pass that portion as a minimum standard before they even move on to the, in the process. Once you've passed those two parts of the, of the, of the process, you're going to get assigned a file manager. And this is going to be sort of your guide throughout the rest of the process. They're going to do a one-on-one -on -one interview, interview with you, as well as a panel interview with you. And we can get into the details if you want, um, Kim, about exactly what the, the panel interview is. But uh, basically what we want to know is we want you to provide us with examples in your life of when you met some of the competencies that we're looking for. Things like decisiveness and uh, initiative, perseverance, stress tolerance, uh, valuing service and diversity, we and interpersonal skills. We want to know who you are. And the concept is... Um, Past behavior predicts future behavior. So we're not going to ask you hypotheticals. We're not going to ask you what would you do in this situation. We're going to say, tell us about a time in your life when, and then you're going to give us examples of something that you've done in your life that relates to policing. After the interview process is going to be uh, the, the pretty much the only two stages, or the really the remaining stages are, are kind of out of your control. It's the psychological testing where we just need you to fall within a normal range in quotation marks, but uh, there's really nothing you can do to prepare for that. The next step is the polygraph. And one of our core values, like I mentioned before, is honesty. Again, nothing you can do to prepare for the polygraph test. Just tell the truth. Like we, we don't want you to go online and Google how to beat a polygraph. Like we're actually going to ask you that question. So don't do it. <laughs> um, but we just need you to tell the truth. And in saying that, uh, we also understand that you're human beings. You're not cyborgs or androids with perfect photogenic memory. So throughout this process, you know, you filled out your personal disclosure form at the beginning and at, we've asked you a number of questions. If at some point in the process, you're driving down the street and you're like, ah, oh, Oh my God, I totally forgot that I, you know, I, I tried mushrooms at a party when I was 21 or whatever. Um, that's okay. You just have to tell us. Just add that additional disclosure. And normally, most of the time, we're going to be okay with it. Again, we just want you to be honest. Um, so that's where the polygraph comes in. And we're going to ask you all about your personal disclosure form there. After the polygraph, it's basically over to the selection panel where they will literally go through your entire application process from beginning to end, ask additional questions, and really get... Oh, sorry, I forgot the backgrounding. There's also a, a backgrounding investigation, typically done by uh, retired police officers. So we're going to go, we're going to learn who you are at work. We're going to learn who you are at home. We're going to ask people how you treat others. We want to know uh, if you're a man, how do you treat women? If you, how do you treat members of the LGBTQ community? How do you pe treat people who are from different cultures? Um, do you tell, you know, insensitive jokes? Are you, we want, we're going to check you out on your social media. We want to know exactly who you are in all aspects of the light of your life so that we know that you're going to meet our very, very high standards before we even take you to selection. And then typically once you get to selection, um, most of the time, once you've gotten to that point, we have a pretty good sense of who you are. So you're very likely gonna be selected at that point, but it happens. Sometimes there's some questions that need to be flushed out. And then of course you get that, uh, I'm pretty sure Brennan could say, he remembers that moment when we all got that phone call. I was a ski bum waitress in Fernie. Uh, and uh, I remember getting the phone call saying, you know, congratulations, you've been hired by the Calgary Police Service. And it's just one of those, like I have goosebumps right now taught, thinking about it because it's just one of those moments that completely changes your life for the better. And you're kind of like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they took me. It's crazy, <laughs> right? So anyways, that's the process in a very quick nutshell. That wasn't yeah. quick. That wasn't quick. <laughs> <laughs> Brennan, what were you doing when you got that phone call saying that you were accepted? 
Uh, I was with my soon-to-be wife, and I was at her place, and uh, I got the phone call, and I was super pumped because, like Ange and like anybody else in this process, you put all your energy and 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 all of your willpower into this process, and you want the very best outcome. Um, unlike Ange, so Ange got on the first time. I do apply a couple of times, and um, I'm glad that I didn't get on when I did because I was quite young when I initially applied and had opportunities to grow and develop from there. But you're from the second that you put your application in uh you're you're just on pins and needles to get through to the next stage and to sit there and wait and know that you've gone to selection and be waiting for that phone call it's nerve-wracking it's exciting um it's quite a thrill frankly it's super pumped super exciting and scary and scary scary. yeah it's a little scary (laughs) no kidding especially when you've been turned down once already you didn't have that (laughs) you six to nine months for this process is is that longer than the actual training once you get into into the program? Um, it's about the same, uh, yeah. but yeah, really good point. Um, it's uh, it's six to nine months for a couple of reasons, right? Like sometimes we only have a certain number of people who are, for example, in our psychological services section. So sometimes there's a bit of a bottleneck to get people into see the psych and do the psych testing. Same thing with polygraph. We only have one or two people that are able to. Um, handle the intake of the applicants. So unfortunately, we get some of those bottlenecks there. And there's, there, like Brennan said, there's a lot of waiting around. Um, but yeah, recruit classes are around 25 to 27 weeks, depending on stat holidays and stuff like that. So around that, you know, six month um, timeline to, to to complete recruit classes as well. And one thing to consider too, Kim, is that uh, we have applicants from across the country. So in those particular situations, we have to accommodate them and try and figure out what schedule best fits them. Because frankly, we have all the advantages uh, if you want to be a police officer. So, and, and we're extremely willing to go anywhere in the country to get them. It's very, very exciting. Is there a perfect age for a recruit or does it all uh, depend on the personality of that person? I actually love this question. It gets asked all the time. Um, The minimum age is 18. You have to be 18 years of age. And in in saying that, it would be quite unlikely for us to hire someone that young simply due to life experience and, uh, you know, just what they're going to bring to our organization. However, in saying that, we recently hired a 19-year-old simply because this was a person who... Um, you know, graduated high school early, got a job at a leadership position at work, like traveled around, like he had amazing life experience. We couldn't say no, because he literally exceeded all of our expectations at a very young age. Um, the other question sort of on the flip side of that is what's the maximum age? And that gets asked all the time, because in all honesty, um, I think it's 75 or 80% of our recruits now are career changers. So they, they've already had one career in their life. So they're in their mid to, mid to late 30s, sometimes even 40s. We've even had recruits in their 50s. And all we really say on the recruiting side is we need you to be realistic, right? Working, we're going to work shift work. Shift work is not easy. In fact, it's really hard. And as we get older, shift work gets even harder. So... Um, As long as you have a really good uh, physical fitness, overall wellness, good nutrition, good sleep patterns, good sleep habits, and a really strong support system at home, you can do it in your older age, like in the higher age category. But we need you to be realistic because you're very like going to be on patrol for minimum, you know, six, seven years to begin with before you can transition to a a non-shift work position. If, if you meet those qualifications even, right? So you, you said 75 to 80%. I thought you were going to say the maximum age was 75 to 80 <laughs> years old. <laughs> there there is some someone fit. in, there's someone in the, in uh, the application process right now in his sixties and we're all like, really? Like I couldn't imagine. I couldn't, yeah. imagine. I was 24 when I started and uh, I, I don't know. I think it's, it takes a lot of guts. There's a lot of women recently that, um, you know, sort of uh, we're interested in policing at a young age and then th- things happen, they get married, they have babies and they have put it off. So a lot of women have been waiting for their kids to be a little bit older and are applying now. We have a lot of really awesome uh, women candidates who, uh, you know, have to work hard and but who are a little bit older that uh, I think are going to be successful. I am going to talk to you about uh, female police officers. Uh, but we'll do that a little bit uh, down the road. Um, let's, let's talk about the training and what's, what's involved with that. So you make it through the process. What happens with training now, Brennan? So the training lasts approximately 27 weeks. Uh, 
and just spoke to uh, the difficulty uh, and the perseverance required to get through the application process. So that that is 100% going to be a foundation and a building block for the next stage. So um, every every obstacle that all these applicants and future police officers uh, go through, they they are all terrific and awesome and wonderful life lessons because you're going to simply build on that. Uh, so anyway, after the application process, which can take six to nine months, you're going to be looking at about 27 weeks in classes. In classes, there's going to be a lot of PT. So hence the reason why we want people to come in with at least a minimum standard of fitness. There's going to be some law. There's going to be some driving. There's going to be some shooting. Uh, there's going to be scenario-based learning. There's a lot of really amazing things that these recruits are going to go through, and all of them will be new. Nobody comes into the job for the most part as an experienced officer. So everybody that comes in is gonna have the same experience. No one's gonna probably have known how to shoot before unless you lived on a farm and people are not gonna be used to some of our, um, our tactical driving and some of the tactics that we use. So everything is new for everybody. And that's the wonderful thing about it. Everybody's going through this stuff as a first. I think one thing uh, to sort of add to that, Brennan, uh, like I, I'd mentioned before, I was a literally a ski bum yeah. waitress when I started recruit training. And I was in classes actually with a number of guys who were in the military, like frontline infantry. So I actually did have experience with firearms and, and combat and stuff like that. And by the time we were done training, I felt 100% confident in my skills and abilities. And we were at the exact same level. So the, we're so fortunate here at CPS. We have unbelievable facilities, unbelievable training, and, uh, and unbelievable instructors. And so by the time you're done recruit classes, you've, we've put you through so many really scary scenarios and really um, lifelike situations that you really feel confident with your ability to handle yourself on the, on the street. Uh, you know, even especially for women, like sometimes they have that question, you know, am I, am I capable? Am I going to be able to handle myself if like I'm kind of a big woman? But for people who are smaller, they, they maybe have that a little bit of self-doubt. But CPS is going to teach you the training and the tactics to be successful uh, on the on patrol for sure. Which How did you feel when you got your badge on that day? Oh my god! So, my, I, like I mentioned, my dad was a police officer, yeah. so I got my badge from my dad. So it was oh, like, wow. yeah, it was. Uh, I'm such a baby. I, I'm I'm in you my tunic. I'm in my full uniform, and I'm just like woo, bawling my eyes. <laughs> It was the same thing for me. Like my dad was in the military for almost 30 years and I had him give me my badge as well. Oh, you and had your dad give me your badge? Yeah, it was awesome. awesome. It was awesome yeah. because like that, that six months next to your previous experience, which was the application process, that six months, it, it takes a lot of hard work, a lot of effort, a lot of perseverance, a lot of resiliency, all the things that we're looking for in a candidate now to uh, be able to get through that and uh, to feel that sense of pride when you get that badge. I still remember that day when I when I got it. Uh, I don't think I stopped looking at it for the rest of the night. It was such a wonderful and amazing experience because I know for a fact that uh, my entire uh, class and in addition to myself, uh, we earned everything that we got there. It was just, it was an overwhelming sense of pride and accomplishment for sure. Well, let's, let's talk about what was your favorite part of training or parts to training. I remember um, it was so unique to me because I, like I, I had been, you know, I'd never went to university. Um, I, I recommend people go to university, but I never did. I actually um, was fighting with my dad because I, I, I wanted to go to university. I thought I had to take criminal law or justice studies or something like that because I wanted to be a police officer. My dad, who was a police officer, was uh, said, no, take, take business, take marketing, take HR. And I'm like, you're stupid dad. Cause I was 20, <laughs> you know, in my twenties. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm just going to apply to the CPS and they'll tell me what to take. And uh, just based on my life experience, they ended up hiring me. So I hadn't gone to school for many years. So for me being in the classroom setting was, was really fun. And I remember laughing every single day, like laughing so hard, my face hurt every single day because you're just in this class with people who are so pumped to be there. Everyone is so positive, so excited to start this new career. And we got to do amazing things every day. Like I couldn't believe that we were getting paid to learn how to shoot guns and learn how to fight and learn how to drive cars real fast and learn about all the amazing things, learn about different cultures, learn about, you know, how to use your communication skills to your advantage. Like it's, I don't know. I think for me, maybe to sort of sum that up is, is this the camaraderie and the the friendships that we made in classes? I thought that was amazing. So, so much fun. Yeah. 
Yeah, I can totally appreciate that. Um, Ange was four classes senior to me. So that's right around six months or so, right, Ange? And uh, I, you know, I don't mind the classroom stuff, but that's not what stimulates me. Uh, like Ange says, it was all about the fighting, the shooting, and the driving, all the hard <laughs> skills, all the fun stuff that you get to do. There's actually even a, an element, wait for this. There's an element in there where you're starting to learn your tactics and your techniques and your high-risk vehicle takedowns, and you're dealing with a person as the situation involves. They don't tell you what's going to happen. Ultimately, they're going to give you a mask. They're going to give you a SIM pistol, and inside that SIM pistol is are these little plastic rounds that have just a little bit of paint in them. So you're fully armed up. You don't know what situation is going to happen and the call unfolds in front of you. Um, and sometimes it's a shoot or no shoot scenario. Sometimes you have to use your uh, verbal skills more often than not. That is the case because that's our very, very best skill. Um, but the opportunity to drive around a track and to have to have these opportunities to be able to actually engage in real police activity. It was a blast. I was completely fired up every single day. It was exciting. Couldn't sleep the night before. Just wanted to get out to there. But then we would be back in the classroom and we'd be learning something about traffic or something like that. And like, that was, that was a complete snoozer for me. But, <laughs> um, uh, but the, in, the entire experience, as, as Anne said, I, I cannot tell you enough when you've rolled around, like, I had classmates like Ange, you'd be rolling around with her and I can speak from experience because I've worked with her. Be rolling around with her, you're huffing and puffing, a little bit of might come out here and there. But, <laughs> oh but because like when you're sweating together and you're learning all these skills and you're sore and you're waking up the next day with all these bumps and bruises, you can't help but build that strong camaraderie. And those people that uh, I went to my class, that I went through classes with and Ange has just said the same thing. I still talk to them all the time. It's, it's terrific. We still talk about some of the stuff that we did, some of the stuff that hurt, some of the stuff that didn't hurt, the injuries that we hid because we thought that we were going to get kicked out of class. Of course, we wouldn't have. Yeah. Um, it, was, uh, it, was, it was by far, to that point, the best experience ever. But we, click, we uh, quickly learned after that that that, and two, was a building block for the next stage. And I think uh, Brennan and I are both kind of uh, training nerds. Like we, we love training and we're so fortunate where just because you're done recruit classes doesn't mean your training stops. I think we could all benefit from more training. We all want to train more. Um, but the, the stuff that we get at CPS is pretty amazing. We've done some really cool uh, multi-agency, large scale scenarios at the airport and Spruce Meadows and Callaway Park, you know, working with the fire department, working with EMS, working with communications and, uh, and that continues throughout your career. Like we just, I just did some training at Max Bell, um, just about like crowd control and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. that sort of training continues throughout your career, which is pretty, we're pretty fortunate for that. That's what you liked. What stands out as some of the biggest challenges or, and I hate to say it this way, but maybe there's something in the training that you didn't like so much. Uh, yeah, that's too, super easy to answer. And that's the day you get sprayed with pepper spray. It's the worst day ever. And I have this mane of long, thick hair. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not just a, like a, an exercise in humiliation. There's actually a purpose to it, right? Like we want to know, you need to know psychologically that you can fight through a really, really challenging situation. So they put you through a scenario where, you know, they'll ask you just to do something like spell your name backwards or whatever. And inevitably you're going to, you're going to look up and then they spray the pepper spray into the bottom of your eyes. And then you have to perform some sort of task, whether it's reading a license plate or taking an offender into custody or something like that, call for help on the radio, whatever. Um, but you do it, you do it, you get through it and it sucks. It sucks really, really badly. And for myself with this giant mane of lion's hair, uh, I th thought it was over. We all went out for blizzards, went to Dairy Queen to get blizzards after, and we each got two and held these <laughs> blizzards on our eyes to just numb the pain. But then we went home at the end of the day and of course you have a shower and then you get it all over again because it's all in your hair. Did you guys decon in a, a big garbage can? Yeah, big garbage can, yeah. disgusting. And what like, happens if you were last? Yeah, it, it, it does nothing. Does nothing. It does nothing. nothing. So it's, it's full of contaminants. Snot, boogers, yeah. yeah, all that stuff because everybody's suffering. So if, if you're you last in the shoot, you're covered in more than just contaminants. This is pre-COVID days. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what they do now. <laughs> But we shared a bucket. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did. We did. <laughs> do, do but yes, tasered as well. Is there tasering that happens as well? And yes. which is worse? 
Well, I will. T- Brennan and I are pre taser days, so we they we, they actually introduced tasers after we were finished classes. But yes, that's definitely part of classes now. And I I have a sick um, love of watching those videos of the people getting tased. Like it is. It's hilarious. I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but it is absolutely and hilarious. Just to speak to the tasers. So um, I didn't actually use one until much later on in my career. I've always been really good with de-escalating situations just by talking to people because we got all the time in the world most of the time. But uh, there it, there was this one situation that came out and I was in a mall and, I, and this one fella was 100% assaultive. He was trying to assault some security guards. And then he tried to assault us. Ultimately, um, the negotiation options were gone because, well, he was coming at us. And the thing that I really liked about it is that it ended a really violent situation really quickly. And the person got taken into custody. As soon as that taser is off, all pain is gone. So it, it is a super useful tool and I'm thankful that we have it. You know, that leads me to this question. I, I lie to people and tell them that I'm five foot six. I'm probably more around five, five and I'm getting shorter every day. It's terrible. <laughs> so see. <laughs> uh, was, was there a height restriction ever to um, joining the, the Calgary police? Well, I remember my dad telling me in his day that there used to be a, a height restriction of 5'8". I, I cannot confirm that, to be honest, but uh, but I have heard that it used to be 5'8", but that was way before our time, way before. There is, there's no height restriction. I will add to it because as a civilian, when I look at police, you guys are dealing with some pretty large individuals that are angry sometimes. So imagining all of your training is all about de-escalating so it it doesn't turn to violence. Do you know, I just came from downtown and uh, I worked there for about six and a half years. I've attended probably three or 400 different protests and the ones over the last few years, all that kind of stuff. And I can tell you for free that that those situations are very real and they, and they happen all the time. The only time that time is not on your side is if something exigent is occurring, which means it means that you have to act now. If uh, you're engaged in conversation, you got all day. I've had, I consider myself pretty fit. So is Anne. She's super fit as well. Um, but that is never our first go-to. Um, the very, very best tool that any officer can develop when they get on the job is their communication skills. Um, just the fact that you're engaging a person alone will prevent them from doing anything. Often the whole mind and body doesn't react at the same time. And if you have the time and space, which is pretty much all the time, then you use those skills. You, you uh, use uh, self-depreciation. Like I'm a pasty old ginch. I use that one all the time. I went to the well more often than not. And at the end of it, some of these people that were very aggressive, that even had clenched fists and doing all this stuff, but they're not really going to assault you in that moment. Um, they end up becoming calm. Uh, you can often get compliance out of them and occasionally if, uh, a few laughs and then they're on their way. I think, um, you know, in regards to the question about height, I think a lot of women in particular, that, that, that comes into mind a lot because women are, are typically shorter than the men. Um, but the good thing about uh, classes and even just the, 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 the readiness test is you can be successful. You just have to use different tactics or different techniques, right? Like if you're a a short woman who weighs 110 pounds, you're not going to be able to muscle the push-pull machine or the handcuff simulator. You're going to need to use your lower body. You're going to need to use physics. Yeah, exactly. So there's there's ways that you can prepare and there's tactics and techniques that we're going to teach you um, in, in recruit classes. Like I, I remember a lot of, we had a couple of really small women in my class, uh, and one really, really short man. And, uh, we're going to give you techniques and tactics to do that for sure. We always use that NRP necessary, reasonable, proportionate for every situation. Uh, but sometimes the first and only, uh, tactic that's going to work is going to be, you know, going hands-on or, or even lethal force. Right. So we're going to give you that, those skills to make those decisions and the tactics to be able to be successful, even if you are small and don't weigh weigh very much for sure. This, this job, Kim, it's like a sport. Anybody that begins a sport for the first time, whether it's hockey, Ange is all about the rugby. Uh, She's involved in so many teams. I love hockey, football, all that kind of stuff. Nobody that ever begins a sport for the very first time is ever super proficient in it. It's through repetitions, it's through exercises, it's through thought patterns, it's through coaching is the reality. And so through coaching and through repetition, you're able to simulate 
uh, possible scenarios. And when you hit the street, you learn from other police officers. You learn what worked for them and what didn't work through debriefs. Um, the bottom line is nobody knows this job in the very beginning. And over time and through repetition, you can become very skilled. Is it equal parts uh, in classroom uh, training and physical uh, exercises? Is it kind of equal or is there one more dominant than the other? I think everyone wishes we had more uh, PT training in yeah. recruit classes. Um, yeah. I, I would say it's pretty close to being 50-50. The, the term that's often used in recruit classes is the drinking from a fire hose. Because like Brendan sort of alluded to at the beginning, there's so much information that we have to literally vomit all over these <laughs> recruits to start. You know, like there's so much to learn physically. Uh, as well as, you know, academically, there's a lot of classroom work, there's group projects, there's community projects, there's learning about diverse cultures, there's learning how to treat, you know, people who are in marginalized uh, groups, we, we want it, we want everyone to be successful in that. And then on top of that, once your brain is numb from writing exams, learning about traffic, learning about impaired driving, learning about writing reports, learning about the criminal code, oh, now you're going to go to PT, and they're going to work you super hard. Oh, and then you're going to learn how to drive a car in an emergency manner. Then you're going to learn dr drill and dress and deportment and firearms and everything. So it's, I, I, I don't want to speak out of turn. It's probably close to 50-50 yeah, with, with classroom and, and uh, the hard skills as well. With all that said, best job ever. Best job best, ever. Best job ever. <laughs> where, where else, with all that stuff that Anne's just outlined, do you get to do that kind of stuff? And, and get paid for it. And, and, and get paid for it. And this is just one of 155 different jobs that's within CPS. Best job ever. Best experience ever. The recruitment process is so long, six to nine months, that when you're accepting your um, members for the class, you've gone through such a, an extensive research on that person. What's the success rate for people coming out of training? Is It must be high. It is It is fairly high, Andrew. Would, yeah. would you agree with that? Now, uh, sometimes we do get uh, applicants or recruits that are back trooped, and that's typically due to injury. So like Andrew was saying, the physical component to the job, it's it's hard on the body. And, and that's why it's so important to come into class as fit. That's uh, That's a necessity. So as a result... Uh, sometimes uh, there will be injuries and those recruits are simply back classed. It's, it's pretty rare that somebody doesn't make it all the way through. Now it does happen, um, but it's extremely rare. More often than not, it's the injury and they just get back trooped and then eventually they'll be on the road like, like the rest of their class. Before we get into discussing the actual job itself, is there anything else you guys want to add about the training? Um, it's all, well, yeah, actually there is best in the country. I think, yeah. um, yeah. the, the, the resources that we have in this building and, and Ange and I can speak from, cause we're both in our 21st year. And when we first started, we were all downtown. Um, uh, the office space was really small. Uh, the, uh, uh, combatives rooms, they were a bit smaller and we had to actually go all over the city here in Calgary. We have what I believe is to be the best facility in all of Canada in on the same campus, and that's what we have is we have a campus. It's just like going to college. On the same campus, we have all the investigative units, but also as a recruit, when you come here, you're gonna, your classroom is going to be here. You're going to do all of your PT here. You're going to do all your scenario-based training here. You, you only leave site for driving and for shooting. Uh, this, this building and the facilities that, that we have here, like we have like four or five gyms within this one uh, facility that we're at right now on campus. And in, of course, in each district, there's a gym as well. But uh, the uh, resources that we have for training, I believe, are very likely best in the country. I think just the one last thing there, Kim, is um, a lot of other agencies, you have to live on site when you're going to, to recruit classes. But in, at the CPS, you go home at night. You go home every night to your family. You can have dinner with your kids. You can tuck your kids into bed. So you come to classes during the day and then you go home to your family at night. And the whole time, like we mentioned before, we're going to, you're going to start getting paid right away by the Calgary police service on day one of recruit training. There's other places in the country where you either have to pay to get your uh, education as a police officer or it's unpaid training. So you're, you're a member, you're a hired employee by the CPS as soon as you get your uh, offer of employment and selected. You're measuring a lot of physical activity. Do you acknowledge that? 
Yeah, I think um, I don't. I couldn't speak to exactly the numbers or the statistics or anything, but we have awards. So when you are uh, graduating recruit classes, there, there'll be awards for traffic law, for criminal law, for physical training, for skills and procedures, for firearms, for all of those things. So uh, each of those units does keep track of the statistics and the and the results of every recruit, and then the recruit with the best results will win uh, awards at the end of recruit training. So I don't know the specific numbers, but... Yeah. but And uh, they, they actually have a few different measurements for fitness. So the fitness is measured upon entry, and then it's continually assessed throughout the 27 weeks uh, with the objective of uh, improvement throughout. How many awards did you win, Brennan? I don't like you right now. <laughs> I won two. I just... <laughs> Such you went to such a nerd. <laughs> which, which which two? And so, so I, Kim, I Kim, 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 I have to say, I'm shocked I got any words in here at all because every time you ask a question, I and I've been on courses with her and I've been on <laughs> workshops. She sits in the very front. The second, anytime some, anytime a question is asked, although there might be some other opinions in the room. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> Trust me when I tell you, everybody oh. has a say, but it's second and third and fourth and so on. It ain't first. <laughs> Okay, oh, Ange, you must around. be happy I brought it up then. What what were the two words that you wanted? No, I don't. I, no, I'm, I'm just totally messing with Brendan. Yeah. I, I, oh. I did like um, the criminal criminal law and the traffic award. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with being perfectly average. <laughs> okay, you graduate. You get through training. Let's talk about the job. When you become a graduate, you are entering the Calgary uh, City Police as a patrol officer. Is that yes. right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, correct. So so when you're at the very end of classes, you're going to get an option to pick which district you want to work at. And the city is divided into eight districts geographically. So you may or may not get your top three choices of which district you want to work in. Um, but we take take things into consideration. Like if you live in Okotoks, they're probably not going to put you in the far north station. They're going to, you know, try to try to do their best to accommodate you where you would like to work. But in the end, it comes down to who wh where the manpower is needed the most. Um, so once you get assigned to your district, you're going to get assigned a, a sergeant who's going to be your supervisor, and you'll be put on a patrol team. And then you'll be assigned an officer coach or a patrol a training police officer. training officer, yeah, yeah PTO. So. Uh, you're going to go through two phases of PTO, each about eight weeks long. And this is, it's not just like, Ugh, kick you out on the street. Good luck over to you. We're going to help you make that transition from classroom to patrol because there's so much learning uh, in between. Classroom is one thing and it's giving you sort of the base. But then once you're on patrol, it's a, it's, it's a totally different world. And you've just sort of received the very minimum, um, you know, baseline training to, to be successful. So your PTO is going to guide you. Uh, you have two different ones. So you have a two different experiences. You're going to do a lot of observation. You're going to just watch a lot. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to um, be assessed on every call, every shift, every set, uh, but not only by your PTO, and but also by your, your sergeant as well. Because we want it, we want people to be successful, right? Like that's the point. We don't want people to uh, you know, we want to build up their confidence to be a police officer. And the truth is on day one, minute one could be the big one, right? Like you could get and out onto has. the street and it, has. and it has for sure. So you could get onto the street and expect to have a nice leisurely shift where you, you know, learn about the district and go and get a tour of the gym or whatever. And the big one comes in, you know, so we need our recruits to be ready immediately on day one. And we're going to guide you. You're going to be, um, like you're gonna have someone assist you the whole time, but uh, like I say, it 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 could happen right away. The big and one. that's why it's so important that when you first come out to the street, that um, that you get as many reps as possible. I talked about that before. Your patrol training officers, their their number one objective is to expose you to as many calls of uh, along the full spectrum as possible, so that when your patrol training officer uh, time ends, and I know I was super pumped. Uh, to go out on the street by myself then the door closed behind me i was like oh i have to make my own decisions now so after that it's it's in the uh, uh officer's interest to take as many and as calls call to call to call to call to call because then you're going to build up this toolbox full of uh, experience that's going to uh, serve you going forward because the reality is the first five years is going to go by super fast like like you're going to blink and it's and it's and it's going to be over because you're absorbing so much and there's so much to learn. And frankly, that's what makes every day absolutely amazing because no, no two days, Kim, are the same. Every day is different. 
Um, you're on, on uh, one day you could be, you know, doing more uh, social disorder than the next time you could be doing a bunch of domestics that involve violence. No two days are the same. Every day is very, very interesting as, as is the weather here in Calgary as well. So, <laughs> yeah. but uh, it's, it's there, there is no career like this where the first five years is going to go by fast and you're going to be exposed to so much and you're going to be absorbing so much that time will literally fly by. What did you love most about patrol? Andrew, would you like to go first? Sure. I thought so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just came from, uh, I've actually just been in recruiting for about a year and a half now. So I just came from patrol in district eight and uh, I don't know. I think, um, the camaraderie with your your team is pretty amazing. Uh, you're in the trenches, right? You're the front line. You're the ones who are dealing with the with everything first and foremost, right? So I think that sense of um, pride in uh, the uniform we wear and and the team that we work with, I think that was really big for me. I loved being a police officer, love, but I I loved working patrol. I loved being the first on scene. I loved. Uh, the team that I worked with. I love being able to support each other and help each other and make our lives a little bit better because the last few years have been really tough to be a police officer. And so we, we've we been able to, uh, you know, band together and support each other and, and help each other through, in my opinion, the most challenging few years in, that I've ever experienced in policing. Totally agree. Totally agree. And I have to echo what Anne said. So the camaraderie uh, piece cannot be understated. Um, you're going to be out in the worst weather, cold, heat, rain. Uh, you're going to be exposed to uh, far more trauma than any human should possibly uh, be exposed to. Um, and as a team, depending on the call for service, you're either going to work together or you, like actually physically, or you're going to work together in trying to get through an investigation. That camaraderie that you build up when uh, you know, you're on hour 16 and you haven't had anything to eat yet because of the calls, um, that, that sort of, uh, experience just brings people close together. But, um, I want to speak to, um, what my favorite part of the job is. So we all get on the job for the same reason, Kim, we, we all got on the job because we want to help people. And I, I had this idea in my mind of what it was going to look like. And I was about 15%, right. But the other 85% was, was so much more than I possibly could have hoped. And, and, and knows this stuff. So, uh, I'm super big on helping people, especially the vulnerable population. These are people that don't have food, clothing, shelter, uh, security, um, and they're just trying to survive. And addiction, Kim, nothing has hit this country like addiction in our 20 years. Um, it's, it's, it's absolutely the biggest challenge that our entire country faces today, in my opinion. So as a result, um, and I worked downtown for the last six and a half years before I came here, like I said, I got to meet them all, especially the street level uh, prostitutes and um, all the entire vulnerable on the male and on the female side and to experience their addiction. Um, so uh, I, I really took it upon myself to try and get to know them all as much as I could. Of course, I'm the police and uh, they don't want to talk to you because one, they'll be looked at as an informant, which they're not. I'm not trying to get information, but over the course of time and persistence and uh, perseverance, and they realize that you actually are there to help them, then you can help them. Um, me in particular, um, I, I like trying to help uh, some of the ladies get off the street because as, as you can imagine, they live horrible lives. So they don't have clothes, or sorry, they don't have shelter. Um, often a lot of them have street husbands, uh, but these aren't loving men that they actually got married to. And in the best case scenario, so uh, they only align themselves with uh, those men uh, for their own personal security. So uh, use your imagination. They experience every possible horror. So uh, I was extremely, extremely passionate about, one, getting to know them, understanding all their stories, uh, because the traumas that they've experienced is not simple as I tried fentanyl today and all of a sudden I'm, a, I'm an addict. That does happen, but typically the lives that they have leading up to where they are at that point in time, um, normal people can't possibly comprehend. So um, I'm a big, big believer that um, when you have the opportunity to do something and when you can help somebody and that you can do better, that you should do better. So I met as many as I could. I got to know as many as I could. Um, sometimes they were just hungry and you just buy them lunch. And then some other times they would uh, just want to sit there and have a cup of coffee with you and just tell you about their previous two weeks. Cause one day you could see them and they will look just like ants, just like normal ish ish. <laughs> and um, then a week later uh, you'll see them and they'll be in sweatpants, no shoes. 
um, just a t-shirt, no bra on or nothing like that. And they're all dirty. And um, by the looks on their face, you can tell that there's been some sort of physical confrontation. They will never tell you anything. So those are your opportunities to be like, okay, now what can we do for you? I always offered everybody the cup. Tell me exactly what you want and I'll make that happen. So um, that's a really long answer to your question, but the, the privilege to be able to actually help people when they're in need and to be able to recognize it and to be able to use our experience um, to be able to reach out to them, to help them to get the resources that they need and ultimately shelter. Um, that hands down, favorite part of the career, without a doubt. And uh, like, Brennan's a pretty special person, but honestly, the stories like that happen all the time, where the fellas and the girls on patrol will, these little, these little things yep. that happen that uh, never get in the newspaper, never get reported, uh, never get kudos for mm -hmm. anything, but uh, it happens more often than not where the someone will, you know, buy someone lunch or, you know, maybe give them a, if they were shoplifting because their, their baby needed diapers, you know, like they'll maybe just take them grocery shopping. I've and, seen it because nobody's there to witness it when it's two o'clock in the morning yeah. and somebody needs help. And the people that she's talking about, they'll go to the 24 hour, whatever to help these people. Yeah. And uh, I've seen it time and time again. I agree with you, Angie. Yeah, it happens all the time. I'm going to say it's, it, this is going to sound really selfish after talk. Brennan mentioned this story, but uh, one of the other things I think for myself anyways, about uh, patrol that I love the most is truly the work-life balance. Like we work shift work and it's brutal. Uh, like I, I, I hated working, you know, 1900s. I'm not good at it. I'm, but, uh, and as I got older, it was harder. I didn't enjoy working night shifts. However, the schedule is uh, conducive to the fact that I was able to coach both my girls' rugby teams, play on two rugby teams yeah. myself, because you actually get a ton of time off. When you're working, you're working. But when you're done, you're done. You don't answer the phone on days off. Uh, you're done. Someone has come in to take your place. And uh, you you have that really valuable life work-life balance. Like, I would get 50 ski days in a year and, you know, go on my hunting trip. I don't know why and... you have a house. I know. Why don't you sleep in your van? I know. Uh, but yeah, play, play and coach rugby and, and get out of town. And I, I like, that's all really important to me. And I know, you know, hockey and, and coaching Brennan's kids is really important to him. So, uh, I, th I think the work-life balance is really, really awesome on patrol. It's hard. It's hard. And I don't want to, you know, brush over that at all, but, uh, we do get lots of time off for sure. Thank you for mentioning it. I was definitely going to ask about the work-life balance and people should know that when they're going into a career with the police. I do have a question. Brennan, you, you touched Kim, on you it. You said this was going to only be 20 minutes. I bet you we fooled you, didn't we? <laughs> it's like, yeah, we, we're just going to get 20 minutes and we're going to be I, good. What I'm you probably it. learned by now is that I can go for an hour. She can go for like three hours straight. Yeah. Uh, we can do this all day. Well, it's a, it's a podcast, so we, we can go as long as it takes to, to get the information out there. Copy. Go you, ahead. You mentioned uh, trauma, what you guys are witnessing. You're under a ton of stress. Could you speak to some of the program, programs and support that's available to you as police officers? I'd love to. And, and if you could fill in the holes when I'm done. Um, yeah. So first off, I, I'm a big believer um, in mental health, Angie's as well, and the nexus between fitness and mental health. Um, it served both of us, obviously, for the sports that we enjoy and for overall health and wellness. But... Uh, the bottom line, Kim, is that, and I, I'm going to apologize because I forget where I read the stat, so I can't source it, but the average person will experience two traumatic events in their life. Maybe that's grandma that uh, passed away in her bed, or uh, they'll come home and uh, a different member of the family perhaps uh, made the decision to commit suicide. Um, so that's two. So the police, as a police officer, on average, and that's not like your your high flyers, they will experience over 750. Um, moments and calls of trauma. So uh, here at the Calgary Police Service, I am so proud to say that uh, our mental health, sorry, our psychology department, what do we call them? Psych Psychological Psych therapy. Psych there you go. Um, uh, gold star, as, as Ange likes to say. Um, it's, it's, it's outstanding. First and foremost, um, if you, uh, require anything for your families, uh, that is going to be there for you, but for yourself as the officer that's uh, received and absorbed trauma. And you heard me t uh, speak earlier about getting to know all the vulnerable in the community and learning all their stories. One of the, uh, spinoff, uh, side effects that I 100% didn't anticipate was that I was going to absorb all their traumas and, and, and they're horrible. So, 
our psych services department, it's literally a phone call. You, you uh, call, you leave a voicemail, then somebody will call you back and then they will speak to you regarding your concern and a whole bunch of different options could be made available to you. All of the services are free, whether it's for you or your family. And in some situations, Kim, um, officers, and Ange can speak to this because uh, she's an incident commander on the street. She did a bunch of years out there doing that kind of stuff. Um, uh, sometimes uh, the officers are going to experience horrible traumas. So think of it this way, Kim. All the bad stuff that you've seen on TV, 100% that exists. The reason why that exists on TV is because um, the police experience that in uh, real life. So... Um, eventually some of these calls may get to the officers. So we are super fortunate uh, to have what is called a reintegration program. Originally it uh, came out of Edmonton and then we received the training here. Uh, Sergeant Mike Huskins um, is the leader for that particular unit and he provides a whole bunch of services, one of which is uh, called prolonged exposure therapy. So say for example, you went to a scene and it was like a multiple homicide and a suicide type call. So that stuff happens. So as you can imagine, normal human beings are not meant to absorb this type of stuff. So you're going to come in and you're going to see what you're going to see. It's horrible. But what what you don't anticipate, because police officers know we're going to go to bad calls. You don't anticipate seeing people's reactions to this stuff. You don't anticipate the smell. So the smell is is the is the is the is the, is the um, the memory piece. So when you go to these types of calls, all these different uh, pieces of indicia, uh, you're going to absorb. So if, for example, there's a problem and you're, you're actually having a hard time dealing with it, you can actually use our psych services and uh, liaise with our reintegration team. And they, they can do what's called prolonged exposure therapy, where they can slowly uh, expose you to um, uh, that that story. And the idea behind that is, and it being prolonged exposure, is you start out, out um, at the very, very beginning of the stories that over time, um, that uh, through exposure and with it being prolonged, that uh, your reaction to it will not be the same as it was when you first started experiencing the traumatic reaction. Did I miss anything, Ange? No, I just, I think the other thing, um, we've brought in a number of programs like Road to Mental Readiness and, and a whole bunch of uh, resources and services, peer support, uh, a chaplaincy program. Uh, we have a number of, you know, even just medical doctors on site here at our, our headquarters. Mm -hmm. And I think the big thing is the stigma that has uh, often gone be gone along with mental health or needing to take kind of take a knee when things have gotten too bad. I, I think that, that we've really crossed a barrier with that where, um, you know, there's no longer that like, I'm a big tough cop. Uh, nothing bothers me. You know that it it really doesn't happen anymore. And we all, uh, I think we're getting better and better. There's we definitely have room to improve always, of course. But I think we've gotten a lot better at recognizing when someone needs to take a knee and supporting them when they do. Not only supporting the officer, but also supporting their family, whether it's mental health or or otherwise. We band around each other to support each other, and and the organization does as well. So I think that's. The reintegration program is a massive success for us, and it's all thank to, thanks to Mike Huskins for sure. He's just amazing, and he's helped countless people come back to work after experiencing trauma or PTSD, come back to work in a healthy way, in a meaningful way, and uh, and to be able to be part of the team again. When they, they've been – like I don't know if this is the right word, but when they're broken, they've been absolutely broken, and they have to go off work for – for psychological reasons and Mike's been able through the reintegration program to bring them back and not only do that successfully, but do it in a way that others uh, support them and that they're not, there's no finger pointing. There's no, Oh, that guy's a wimp, whatever it's, it's uh, we're supporting each other to get well and to stay well. I can actually add to that. And so I just finished the second of two courses, uh, Kim, uh, that uh, was facilitated uh, by Sergeant Mike Huskins and Abby. And, um, Squirrel. Um, and uh, the amount of uh, police officers that were in that training session uh, was amazing. We actually had to use an auditorium. So 100%, and is right, the culture surrounding uh, mental health has completely changed. Um, there are plenty of police officers out there that 
uh, want to help other police officers because um, trauma is actually an injury. So it's not something that it's a feeling or anything like that. Um, it's an injury uh, that the officer sustained, whether it's over accumulation. So you've attended a whole bunch of stuff like that 750 stuff I was telling you about, Kim. Or perhaps it's one particular incident uh, that the officer is having a hard time with. The culture has changed. It's wonderful. Um, I'm super passionate about sharing that message uh, because at the end of the day, uh, we, that camaraderie exists and we want to help each other. We want to help the community, but we also want to help each other. I, I'm grateful that we live in a time where uh, the mental well-being on everybody in society, you're not asked to tough things out. I can, I can say, Kim, that Mike Huskins, because I'm aware of some of the stuff that uh, he and his team, Avi, and the rest of his team have worked on, he's 100% changed lives. So yeah. these are Saved all- lives. Yeah. Save lives. So um, unfortunately, um, there are rates of uh, police officer suicide. I, I don't know what they are, but they exist for a reason because the officers um, were under such a burden that they made the decision that they made. So um, the program was so successful in Edmonton that it came out here to Edmonton. And I can say for a fact, because I've talked to uh, talk to Mike about various different files, not names, but situations. And 100% he saved lives. Yeah. This isn't something where it's just like, okay, let's just give the person some time to come back, go back to work and then do their thing. He has 100% changed lives. Yeah. I can't think of another career that offers the diversity in what you guys do. Um, I'm hoping we can talk a little bit about some of the other roles that you've uh, had during your time with the Calgary There's City so many. Police. There's so many. <laughs> yeah, we'll try not to go on uh, about an hour talking about that. But I'm just curious to know the diversity. Well, Kim, in some of the Kim don't, don't look at me. You need to talk to her. <laughs> That's just a warning. Uh, we'll try to keep it uh, short a little bit. Um, but also, along with the different roles and the di diversity and what you can do if you become a police officer, I, there's a lot of continuing education available to you. You're, you're constantly um, learning. Yeah, we do a lot of training. Uh, and like I say, I think we could always do more. We offer a lot of in-house training at our Chief Corporate Learning Center, whether it's just, you know, through recruit classes, but then throughout your career, uh, additional investigative training, uh, undercover techniques, surveillance techniques, all sorts of, uh, you know, there's so much that we that we offer the our members. Um we there is an opportunity to take additional external education as well like it's pretty challenging to do that when you're working patrol uh you have to have some pretty significant time management skills to be able to do some uh additional university or post secondary education when while you're working patrol it's it's quite challenging but there is a little bit of support with uh with the organization as well for for people that want to you know continue to educate themselves for sure can we talk about what other roles you guys have have performed while being a member of the Calgary City Police? Yeah, sure. Um, like Brennan and I both been on, you know, we're around that 20 year vintage. So um, I can honestly say so patrol is obviously everyone does it. Uh, I worked in District 1 and District 2 and District 8 uh, in on patrol. Um, I got married and had both my babies while I was on a CPS member. So um, when I, I moved into the, uh, major events and emergency management team, uh, where I was, uh, in charge of organizing large scale events, whether they were planned or unplanned, you know, things like stampede or, or, you know, lilac fest, stuff like that. But then, you know, if there was a anti-police rally or some sort of protest, we would also be in charge of the, or of, of organizing the operational plans for that. Uh, I actually got to work in the CCLC or the Chief Crowfoot Learning Center where I taught recruit classes uh, for a short time. Now, that was a wicked experience. I absolutely loved working there. Um, I even worked in HR a little bit where um, when an officer wants to transfer into a, a specialty unit, we hold competitions. So you don't just sort of walk walk onto the job. You have to apply and compete against your peers for positions. So I was I was facilitating those uh, those internal competitions. Uh, then I got promoted and I went back to eight district where I ran a team on patrol down uh, down in eight district and and came to recruiting after that. Brennan, well, for myself, so um, Ange and I had completely different careers, and that's what actually makes the CPS and policing so awesome. There are so many different things, like I said before. It was over 155 different roles. So I, like Ange, I started out on the road. I was there for about six and a half years. After that, 
or actually during that, I took the undercover course and the surveillance course with the mindset that I was going to do some undercover drug work. But during that process, um, I was exposed to um, drug production investigations. So I got super pumped about that. So um, we investigated grow ops, meth labs, fentanyl tableting labs, ecstasy, GHB labs, all, all that kind of stuff. We got to learn the chemistry of behind all that. I even got to go on some expert courses. And I uh, actually learned how to make some of that stuff. It's pretty cool. Actually, I learned how to make all of it. Total break and bad. Um, <laughs> I'd kill myself for like for sure. Like I'm not that competent. But it was it was uh, it was a lot of fun to actually learn the chemical uh, steps required to make some of this stuff. Um, after that, uh, I went to the gang team for about a cup of coffee, just about a year. And then after that, I went downtown for another six and a half, seven years. I was on the beat, so I was out there walking around. Uh, being uh, uh, in the back alleys at two in the morning on a winter night or whichever, that was our job was to get out there and be seen and, and find um, crime in, in progress on foot and also to be able to connect with the community. That was really awesome. And then after that, um, I reached out to Ange about coming up to recruiting and uh, there was nobody else available. So she had to take me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, I've been up here now um, a year in February. So about 15, 16 months now. And, um, I've enjoyed my entire career, Kim. It's It's been outrageous. Uh, and I can honestly say that every time that I was in that spot, I was like, this is the best job ever. I want to stay here forever. And then when I went to the next spot, it was the same thing. And that is that in and of itself is what makes policing awesome and different is that you have many careers within a career and there are so many different options that you can do to keep your interest. Uh, you will always be working towards something. And we often tell our participants with the Run With Recruiter program that um, there is no getting there. This is a lifelong journey. It's an adventure. Um, sometimes it's, it's like getting onto that roller coaster. You're going to be in the front. You're going to have a four point harness on, but you know, one part, you're going to go through some water. Then there's going to be another part that's going to blow snow at you and all that kind of stuff. There's lots of ups and downs, lots of learning moments, a lot of challenging moments, a lot of amazing moments. Um, and there's no job like this. And that's what makes policing different is you can experience everything, multiple lives within one life, really. Um, Ange, your email signature has something called Alberta Women in Public Safety. Could you talk a little bit about that? And are uh, female numbers coming up as police officers? Yeah, there's actually um, some really exciting things happening uh, when it comes to women in policing and public safety. I, I am a member of the Alberta Women in, in Public Safety, which is a group of women who across the province um, from different agencies, whether it's police or sheriffs or corrections or bylaw, transit, fish and wildlife. And we've created this group uh, or, or people before me have created this group. Uh, where we can support each other, go to training, uh, have, uh, you know, learn from each other, uh, find mentors and uh, attend events with each other. We're planning this big conference right now, which is causing me a lot of <laughs> stress, but but it's going to be amazing. And it's I'm so grateful to be part of this group of women um, who are who have been doing this before me and learning from them. And it actually inspired me to to start a Calgary Women in Policing group, which is brand brand new. We literally just started. We have uh, uh, we've had one event so far. Uh, I just posted it a couple weeks ago. So it's brand, brand new to the CPS. And again, this is a group of women who are going to work together, sworn civilian, uh, and everyone is welcome. We're going to host social events. We're going to do training. We're going to do mentorship. We're going to do um, volunteerism and giving back to the community. Just as a group of women supporting each other, uh, lifting each other up, not only personally, but professionally. So we're we're working together to create this something really cool and unique that's, uh, um, we can make it whatever we want, right? So it's not necessarily exclusive, like men can come to our events. It's not, it's not a girls only club kind of a thing, but we're going to focus on the events that are, or the, and topics that are important to us as women. So um, I'm super excited to, um, to get started with that. Um, again, an amazing group of women who are all ready to put in the work, not only just be part of the group, but ready to put in the work and, uh, and support each other through it. Um, 
And I will say just a shameless plug, we have a uh, women's recruiting boot camp coming up at the end of May. Uh, the applications are now closed, but uh, if anyone's listening, we will be doing another one uh, in the fall. And this is going to be an opportunity for women uh, pre-application to really experience the physical aspects of policing uh, as a woman in, in CPS. So uh, sometimes women struggle with the physical readiness, uh, whether it's the testing or even through recruit classes. So we want to give them an opportunity to come to Westwinds. They're going to run the full A prep, like do the actual fitness test. We're going to run them through some really challenging scenarios. We're going to do like uh, almost a mini stress test with our skills unit. And they'll have an opportunity to spend the whole day with us, have those real conversations with current CPS female members, and really get a sense of what it's like to be a, a woman a police officer in Calgary. So it's going to be the first. We've done some women's conferences before. This one's going to be very, very physical, though. So I'm pretty pumped about it. Um, I guess I'll, we'll see how it goes this one in May. But uh, we had over 100 applicants. Uh, we can only take 36. So we're doing uh, the selections for that um, coming up. And then we'll have 36 people come to Westwinds and uh, and participate in the weekend. It'll be amazing. I'm pumped. I think our, our to answer your question, sorry, I didn't really answer it. But I think we have about a 20, 20 to 25% uh, women on the job of uh, for frontline for for sworn members we have a lot of uh we have obviously have a huge uh demographic of civilian members too that work at the cps that are super important and do a lot of amazing work for us uh and a lot of women are civilian members that work for cps but sworn i'm, I'm pretty sure it's around 20 to 25 percent and you're seeing you're seeing more female applicants as we yeah. go along here yeah yeah, for sure. Like uh, we, the thing is, is we're looking for the best people. Like it doesn't matter to us. Uh, you know, we we just want the best people to join the CPS. And sometimes the best people are women, right? So we want the best people to be sitting in the car beside us when we're when we're on patrol. And that uh, it doesn't matter if they're men or women. And we we just find that women have been successful in recruit classes. So we're looking for the best of them. Okay. Cam, can you yes. imagine? Being in the car with Ange. It's a dream. <laughs> it is a dream. <laughs> she lets you know who the alpha is right away. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I only have a couple more questions for you. Letter box. One, one of them being, uh, what are some misconceptions out there about police officers? I think um, the, one of the messages that uh, Brennan and I are trying to get across, because uh, we're being in recruiting, we're very in the public a lot. We're, whether we're doing uh, information sessions or doing podcasts or interviews on the news or on social media, we're in the public a lot. And we really want to quash the misconception that police officers are robots, right? Like we're just humans. We're just like you. We have families. We have feelings. We have problems. We have things that we care about. Uh, and we're just normal human beings. Um, so sometimes we're often seen and stereotyped simply because of the uniform that we wear uh, and, and what our job is. And the truth is we're all very different. We all bring very unique um, experiences and um, thoughts and, uh, you know, things to this to this organization that, that makes us a really strong organization. So we, Brennan and I, really go out of our way to be real with people, to um, make mistakes, to sometimes not say the right thing. <laughs> The thing that's super important to Ange and I is to communicate uh, the realities of life as a recruit and life as a police officer. Um, the bonuses far outweigh any of the difficult moments. Yeah, there's bad times, but um, we want to be real with people. We want to explain to them, you know, what the job includes. And uh, for a lot of people, it's an awakening for them and they still want to pursue their goal. And for some others, um, they're like, nope, this isn't for me and that's okay. Um, ultimately, it's a discovery process, um, but it, it is absolutely critical that we explain the realities of what life is like as a police officer and the awesomeness of it, because there are so many amazing elements to this job that uh, even Ange couldn't cover it all off here in the next two hours. How often, this is a misconception uh, that parents might do, but how often does this happen to you where a parent will say to their child, you better be good or I'm going to have this person arrest you? Has that happened to you in, oh, yeah. in public? Yeah. yeah, I don't like it when they do that. No, I don't, I, don't, I don't like it when they do that. So the reason being is, is that 
we are um, we are to be trusted, and we're we're we are there to be helpful uh, when people need help. We don't ever want to be viewed as um, a tool for punishment. Right. Uh, when the reality is that is not the case. Our job is 100% all day, every day to serve. Every officer that is put on this uniform has the same agenda to go out and to serve and to be a help. Uh, so personally, I, when, whenever those moments happen, I laugh a little and I try to laugh it off a little bit, but then yeah. I always explain to the child exactly what I just said. We are always here to help you. Right. Um, we are not, we are not, um, going to be the there. We're the good guys. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're the good guys. Yeah. Like that's, and we, we want real everyone. life people that get to go to real life problems and solve. Yeah. Well, okay. kids look up to you like professional athletes in the same way, I think. So I've never made that mistake with my kids, I, but I've heard people do that. Yeah, we, um, we, want, we want parents to think that, that their, their kid, when they're scared, can come to us and we're going to help them. Not be right. afraid that's to speak it. with us. Yeah, that's yeah exactly. Um, I have a question about the friendly rivalry with other first responders. Is that a thing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> hundred percent it is, but it's totally friendly. Um, we are always battling up North. Obviously Edmonton's in the playoffs this year. And to be honest, how many first round draft picks do you need to be able to get into the playoffs? But that's a whole nother situation. Um, but, uh, like for, for sure, there's that friendly rivalry with other agencies, with, with other services as well. Like, uh, we go back and forth between the other agencies in Alberta, whether it be Edmonton, Lethbridge, Medicine Hat, or what have you. Uh, but also within the other services, you know, um, for EMS or for fire, we go back and forth all the time. Um, frankly, that that camaraderie just builds the relationship even stronger because often we're going to go to a scene where all three of us are going to be there. And often more than one unit out of each respective agency. So the opportunity to build that friendly rivalry, we go back and forth. Um, that's that's super important. Um, and when we get to the scene, we can now put that aside and to, to be able to deal with the problem, but you can probably speak more to that Ange. Well, I'm married to a firefighter. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. so we bust each other's chops all the time at our house on whose job is better. <laughs> do, but, uh, do your so shifts sorry. line up? Do you ever see your husband? Um, it, it's challenging. We're, we're quite lucky. Our kids are older. So, uh, they work on a 24 hour schedule. So they do like a 24 on two days off, 24 on four days off. So for sure the schedules line up, uh, but it's sort of ships in the night sometimes for sure. Um, but just like Brennan said, like we bust each other's chops definitely about, uh, about our jobs and who's, who the real heroes are and stuff like that. But the, the truth is we're all on the same team and even, even policing agencies, right? Like uh, we, Calgary and Edmonton, obviously, Battle of Alberta in all senses. But I'll tell you right now, uh, the recruiting team in Calgary and the recruiting team in Edmonton, we we connect with each other all the time. We help yep. each other all the time. We steal each other's ideas and share ideas. And we give each other exactly what we need because we are all on the same team, 100%. We may have a different flash on our shoulders, but we're all brothers and sisters, definitely. It's a, it's a sibling rivalry is what exactly. I'm going to decide exactly. on. Um, okay, I'm based in Edmonton, but I will ask you guys this question anyways. What is the Calgary advantage? What makes Let's the Calgary advantage? Let's go. I've been waiting for you to ask that question. <laughs> oh my God. Brendan's been vibrating wanting to ask that question. What, what makes Calgary different from other police services and agencies? So we're, we're going to probably go back and forth here, just like a tennis match. So Ange, as I miss some, you can, I'll look to you and, and you can pop in. So, um, one thing we can say without certainty um, or with, with certainty, Kim, is that the job's the same no matter where you go. So whether you're in Edmonton or here or Ontario, BC, the job's the same. The same obstacles remain. The same awesome opportunities are there. The job is not different. What matters is the where. So here in Calgary, um, to say first, um, the thing that, that, that we didn't realize that we we're enjoying as much was the fact that the cost of living cost of housing is radically different than some of the larger urban centers, like in the lower mainland and in Ontario. So um, we've heard from some of our brothers and sisters in Ontario that their commute times are, are, are quite long. Like they can be up to a couple hours one way each day because they can't afford to live near their uh, agency that they're, that they're currently working at. So 
with the Calgary Advantage, uh, we we offer affordable housing. We offer affordable lifestyle. We offer a far better commute time. Our facilities are outstanding. Like our gyms here and all the resources and all the courses and all the things that are available to you are outstanding. Um, each officer that uh, comes here now for some agencies uh, that are larger, they're going to offer the same thing, but we have over 155 different vocations within this job, in addition to a uh, frontline police officer to experiment with throughout your career. There's so many more things. Yeah, I think uh, the big thing for, for me and my family is the proximity to the mountains, right? Like right. We, uh, yeah. we spend a lot of time, uh, you, you almost take it for granted that we, we get to see the beautiful Rocky Mountains every day from all sides of the city. They're just constantly on the on the horizon for us. And they're just an hour and a bit away. So we can get to the mountains very, very quickly, very easily. Like I mentioned, I, I think I got four, 30, 30 ski days in this year. Uh, when I was on patrol, I was getting 45, 50 ski days in. So being in the mountains is huge for us. We have amazing uh, wildlife populations, uh, world-class fishing. Uh, the Bow River runs right through the city and people travel from all over the world to fish in the Bow River or to ski in our beautiful mountains. We, uh, the, the outdoor lifestyle that we offer here in the city, we have hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of bike trails right inside the city. We have a ski hill in the city. We have a world-class Olympic facility uh, at Windsport that is available to the public at all times. We have multiple uh, recreational um, facilities throughout the city too. Of course, the, the latest is the, the building of our new arena, obviously long overdue, but that's going to be a pretty amazing uh, structure and, and center right in our downtown. And I mean, like Kim, I'm going to say it, we're the home of the Calgary stampede, right? It's the best party in the country, right? I've lived here almost my whole life. And I'm one of those nerds that just, I love stampede. It's one of the best times. Like it's so wild. People come here from all over the world and, uh, you know, you take them out to a stampede breakfast where they're going to get pancakes and sausages and bacon and, uh, and whatever in the morning and they're looking for the 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 till they're looking where they have to pay for this breakfast and when they find out that you don't pay for stampede breakfast that's just how we roll here in calgary that blows their mind the 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 calgarian hospitality that we have here that we welcome uh people from all over to the stampede and people like the the richest uh you know ceos of the biggest companies downtown they they ditch their suits and they grab their shoddy belt buckles and their terrible hats and their cowboys for 10 days right so i think that's one of the it's a major draw in the city uh you know the rodeos the chuck wagons the parades it's an unbelievable event that really brings the city together uh it, it's weird it's a weird experience but uh i love it i'm a it's total killer. stampede nerd it's it's crazy um on top of all that Ange, we have quick and easy access to bc so the whole bc life um so I'm a Montana boy myself. I love Montana. If uh, if uh, you've seen that show Yellowstone with Kevin Costner, oh yeah, hundred percent like for real. That's exactly what it's like. But in real, in the first person, it's way better. They have a lake that's almost ninety miles long. Seventy miles of it is on the American side. It 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 it, it is emerald green water. It's Caribbean. Uh, Twenty five years ago, it wasn't very well known. Now there's a lot more Canadians down there. Um, it it. The second that you go through Fernie and then you're going to be heading down towards the border, it literally goes up 10 degrees and uh, it's, it, it is so much fun. And there's sand dunes everywhere. It's absolutely amazing. The other thing that I really like um, is the bedroom communities, Kim. So in Calgary, if you want to stay in Calgary, that's perfect. There's the rich diversity that we have. We have a festival for everything. And often there's, there's, there's overlap on the weekends because we have so amazing, so many amazing festivals. Name your, name your country of origin. There's a festival for it. It's amazing. But me and myself, I grew up small town, so I prefer to leave work in Calgary. And after five years, I actually moved to one of the bedroom communities. So I live just south of the city. Um, and uh, my commute time every single day up to the northeast here is 38 minutes. It's it's very quick. The great thing is is that all of the bedroom communities they're all on opposite sides of the city. So I'm on the south side. On, on the north side there's Airdrie. On the east side there's Chestermere. On the west side there is Cochrane. I actually was looking at Cochrane because much like Ange, I love the mountain life. If you like paddleboarding, skiing, uh, fishing, camping, hiking, whatever your thing is. It's all available to you like right now. Um, 
because I go to Montana quite a bit, I decided to go uh, with the Southern option. But even from my place right now, I can be in the mountains in less than an hour. The, the options that are available to you by being a police officer in Calgary are limitless. I was born in Edmonton and I will confess to you that I was driving through Calgary last summer and I actually said to my wife, you know what, this is a beautiful city. Um, we're pretty lucky. Yeah. yeah, we are. We're all fortunate. Actually, we're very fortunate to be in Alberta, period. Yeah. We're very fortunate to be in Canada and to live the lives that we have and to have the opportunities that we have for our families and for ourselves. Agreed. Well, I don't say this to all public servants, but I definitely say this to police and first responders. Thank you so much for your service. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast today to talk about your career. I really appreciate it. It is a privilege. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, we had a blast. Thank you for having us. And uh, if anyone ever wants to get a hold of us, uh, please go to our website, join.calgarypolice.ca. You can email us and one of us will respond to you for sure. So if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us anytime. And fill out an application, join.calgarypolice.ca. We are hiring. Let's go. To learn more, please visit join.calgarypolice.ca. Thank you for tuning in to the Job Talk podcast. For more information, please visit us at thejobtalk.com. Our podcast music was created by our friend Mike Malone in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada.